Hours of Christ Fellowship with Dr. Stephen Gray. Uh, the first thing I want to say to you this morning is you noticed my boat here. This is the SS Glory. <laughs> I may get in here <laughs> and not be able to get out. <clears throat> but this is about what Billy said when he walked into Gethsemane is what religion has done to the gospel is this distorted it. You see, if you're, when you're saved, you got to give your will to God. You got to surrender. You can't kind of pray a prayer. You can't go to church. You can't act religious. You got to sell out. You got to say, okay, Lord, what do you want me to do? So I want you to build a kingdom. I want you to build it in here. Then I want you to help others. And so you got to get out of the boat if you want to be saved. You can't, you can't stay in the boat and be saved. you got to get out. And the life we're supposed to be living is supernatural. It's not lukewarm. It's not, oh, this is boring. It's supernatural. But you got to be building the kingdom. you got to be following Jesus. You know, I was sitting here as we were praising... I was reminded we were over in that house, not Margaret's, another house where we were meeting. I was sitting on the front row. You know, people got mad at me because he said, you didn't come here to plant a church. And I said, look, I don't go anywhere to do anything. I just go because God told me to go. I said, but God spoke to me on the front row of that church. And he said, I want you to plant a church. He said, it's going to be followers of Christ. That's where the name came from. Not, not church, but a follower of Christ. We, we don't need people to come to church. We need them to follow Jesus. We come here to celebrate that we're following Jesus. So that's a big difference. Hallelujah. But the message today is about faith. It's about the battle of distraction and deception. Romans 1.17 says, The just shall live by faith. You know why we can't live by faith? It's because we're distracted. We're deceived. We think we can keep the wounds. We think we can keep our strongholds and follow Jesus. You cannot. Strongholds cause you to react. It, it's like empowering your flesh. You think, why can't I do this? Why, why do I keep doing this? Because you're empowering the flesh. Your, your strongholds empower the flesh. Most Christians are not living by faith. Let me say that again. Most Christians are not living by faith. They've been taught how to do certain things, but they haven't been taught how to remove their strongholds. They haven't talked, taught about how to be intimate with God. And many pastors and leaders want people to come to them. They want, they want to be the answer man. You're hindering their growth. Because I guarantee you there's things in people's lives you ain't got a clue and you don't have the level to deal with it. They better, they better get to God or they're in trouble. Jesus was not prone to do flashy miracles. They, they asked him to. They said, do us a miracle. He said, he didn't want to do that. But yet he walked on water. If that ain't flashy, I don't know what is. So I, I begin to think, you know, he walked on water because there must be more in that than I realized. Not only did he walk on water, but Peter walked on water too. Now, come on. Do you not see the significance of that? I mean, you think maybe he's telling us we can do the supernatural. We can do things our mind says, no way, don't you get out of that boat. Wow. And, and, and to me, it says as a Christian, as a true follower of Christ, I cannot stay in the boat. Look at your neighbor and say, you can't stay in the boat. You can't stay in the boat. 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 
So I'm thinking, why do Christians struggle, and not just people in America, but all Christians, why do they struggle so much to live by faith? It's like, it's like hard. And the answer is because of distraction, which is a form of deception. So I, I heard this. The, the Lord said, the, the, the devil's main tool is distraction. It's a key scheme in his arsenal. And I thought, Lord, why is that? Now think about this. This is kind of blew me away. I said, Lord, why does the devil use distraction so much? You know what the Lord said? Because he's got nothing else. You have, God did it all. The work is finished. Jesus said, you have everything you need. Your identity's been set. You have all the power. I said, well, then God, why ain't I walking in it? Because you're distracted. You're distracted. And you, you know where he starts with your identity? He wants you to feel beat down, worthless, hopeless. You heard a testimony this morning about someone who was walking in that. Why? Because God didn't do what he said? No. Because God didn't do all, provide all things? No. Because he wasn't in God's will. He was still in the boat. Devil ain't got nothing else. He's been defeated. He's been defeated. Amen. And so all, all the way he's got is to make us think, don't you believe what Jesus did? Don't you get out of the boat? Don't you try to walk on water? I want you to see a couple of verses. Because I think that's such a, a critical truth. Is... He ain't got nothing else. All he can do is distract you. Revelation 12, 12 says, Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. That's why he's mad. He's, he knows he's got a short time. Wow. Listen to Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. That's what happened when Jesus died on the cross. Here's my favorite, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. Listen to what this says. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. He don't want you to see what you've got. He don't want you to believe that you can do great things. He wants you to stay beat down and discouraged, distracted and hopeless. Who do not believe, least the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, whose image of God should shine on them. That's the devil's whole plan is to discourage you. And distract you from the truth. The Bible is full of examples of distraction. One from the Old Testament is, is Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 4 verse 8. Nehemiah had come back out of Babylon to build the walls of Jerusalem back up so that they could protect themselves and, and not be <laughs> defeated. And so he's building the walls and all this, the neighbors around him, which were mainly Arabs, came and said, hey, come down here. We want to talk to you. You know what Nehemiah said? I ain't coming down. I'm busy. I'm doing that which God sent me here to do. Amen. Amen. Nehemiah 6, chapter 6, verse 1 through 3 says, when the walls are being rebuilt, he said, I can't come down. You know, that's why when you start down that path, when you start really saying, okay, God, I'm getting serious, you think the devil's going to be like, okay, I give up. No, that's when it gets worse. He comes and says, hey, over here, look at this problem. Look at that problem. Man, he's always trying to get your eyes off the truth. So when I feel or sense distraction, I immediately go, okay, God, what were you saying again? What, what do you want me to do? 
Jesus would not be distracted. Luke 9, 51 says, Jesus set his face for Jerusalem. You know, he started telling his disciples when they were up in Galilee, he said, hey, I'm going to Jerusalem to die, to the cross. And they're like, no, you can't go there. Don't go there. And, he, and so the Bible says he set his face. He was determined he was going to Jerusalem. That was his plan. And listen, no man knows your purpose. No pastor knows your purpose. Even if he's prophetic and he gets a glimpse of it, he doesn't really know your full purpose. That's why you heard the testimony this morning. I told the young man, I said, you got to seek God. Seek God. to Let him tell you what to do. Why? Because that's empowered. When you've heard from God, you're empowered. That's the key. John 11, 1 they, they let Jesus know Lazarus is sick. They called for Jesus to come. The word was sent. He whom you love is sick. That's what the Bible says. He said, well, he dropped everything and ran to Lazarus. No, he didn't. He saw God and God said, hang on, wait, wait a few days. You see, we always think we know what God's doing. Trust me, we don't have a clue. We know what he's telling us to do, but we don't see the big picture. So many times we think, man, everything is going down the tubes. My life is a mess. I know I'm speaking to somebody here, if not a couple of people. God, what are you doing? I'm telling you what, he's doing something. You know what he's doing? He's saying, yeah, I'm getting you ready. See, when I get you ready, I can do something. You ain't ready yet. I'm still, I'm still working. I'm still working the clay. I'm getting you ready. God's either, if you're not walking, then it's, God's getting you ready. My job is to try to pray and help you cooperate with God getting you ready. Whoo, that's some good preaching. Matthew 15, 21 through 24, a lady runs up. Says, Jesus, my daughter's sick. You got to come. She's sick. You know what he said? He said, I'm sorry. I'm called to the lost sheep of Israel. But that just blows my mind. He said, I ain't called to the Gentiles. That'll be Peter's job and Paul's job. No, I'm called to these 12 disciples. I'm called to the lost sheep of Israel. He was so focused on his mission. Some people say, well, what, if you say, well, what did Jesus come to earth for? Well, die on the cross. Isn't it interesting that he spent three years of his life that down on the cross took one afternoon in three years? You know what he spent the rest of his time doing? Discipling 12 men. Think about that. Discipling 12 men. Why is distraction... The main scheme of the enemy was well, Isaiah 50, verses 4 through 7 says, Jesus set his flint toward the cross. That, that was his focus. He was preparing those disciples because he said, I knew I'm going to be leaving. So I, I got to leave you guys in charge to build the kingdom. Don't make any sense to die and, and get everybody forgiven if nobody knows what I've done. Or nobody knows I've, I've brought the kingdom. I read you last week from Matthew 24 where Jesus said, Fear not for all these wars are going to happen and all this stuff. And it ends, that passage ends with him saying, And the gospel of the kingdom. <laughs> the gospel of the kingdom. Not salvation, not give your life to Jesus. The gospel of the kingdom. That means when you get saved, you just join the mission to build the kingdom. And see, we wonder, well, where's the power? What's going on? You ain't building a kingdom. People think they can do whatever they want to. No, you're under direction of the king. I always ask people, here's, here's one of my little tricks. I ask people, what, what, what did God say or what are you doing? And I want to hear, are you reasoning or are you hearing from God? Because here's the way it works. God goes, well, God told me. Or, well, I thought that if I, and then I figured, and, and then I thought maybe that, that ain't somebody's heard from God. I mean, that's real simple. Most people are, are moving in their own rationalizations. 
from their own mind. Why didn't you witness that person? Well, I didn't think they'd receive it. I didn't think, I didn't think, I didn't think. That's your, that's your problem right there. When you make a commitment to the Lord, when you really sell out, all of life becomes a distraction. I mean, I don't think we figured that out yet. But it says, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And he says, and all these things will be taken. And so when I was still in business, what I started to realize is if I really started seeking the kingdom, God would take care of my business. I'd try to call people and I'd, I'd be months trying to get in touch with somebody. And I said, I repent. I'm going to start seeking the kingdom. And the next morning, that guy calls me on the phone and says, are you looking for me? I, you were on my heart today. God started doing all this stuff. Hallelujah. But look, you have to be healed so you can die. Is anybody listening? You see, when you got a wound, let's say you were really abused when you were a child. Well, guess what? When you ever get around somebody that looks like a father figure or a mother figure, you react. You ain't in the spirit. You react. So you got to get healed. That's what we're seeing. These two ladies in our church are going through this inner healing course to help people learn to get healed so they stop reacting and start being directed. By the Spirit of God. Some people run from being healed and they think they're going to do something. You ain't going to do nothing. You're just running around circles. Remember Matthew 6.33, but seek first the kingdom. Remember Luke 14.28, talking about discipleship. The priority of life, now listen, the priority of life is not family. It's the kingdom. The family's not your problems. It's God's problems. But let me, let me explain something to you now. Because I know some of y'all got family problems. And some of y'all spend hours praying for your family problems. And they're all going away, right? No, they ain't going away. They ain't going away. You know why? Because you've missed something. You've missed the truth. When you start focusing on the kingdom. And you start loving God. You will bring dominion into your family. Let me give you a great story. Years ago, we did a big called Day in the Park down in Mobile, Alabama. Integrity was involved. It was a big deal. The whole city got involved. We had uh, churches brought uh, mimes, uh, all kinds of skits. We gave away clothes. We had ministry to all kinds of people. There was a lady there who uh, her husband was a dentist and so she said, um, well, I feel like I need to help, but I made a commitment to my, to my little girl, my daughter, that I would do cello lessons with her in the summer. So she said, I'm not sure I can do this. And I said, well, you know what? You go pray and ask God. So God told her to let the cello lessons go and to do what he wanted. And she called me. It was a big deal. She's, she's crying. She's saying, Brother Steve, I feel like I've got to help you. Amen. And I said, okay. And so she worked hard. She was really instrumental. She was almost like my right arm in doing this day in the park. I think it was like in April or, or March or something. In May, Mother's Day, she comes to a small group meeting. We'd had this successful day in the park. And she comes in there and she hands me a Mother's Day card. It was from her daughter. I'll never forget this. She said, the daughter said, Mom, I was really hurt when you didn't do what you said to do the cello lessons. But... I saw how much you honored God. Wow. And it's made a commitment and I've given my life to Jesus Christ. Wow. That's bringing dominion into your family. You see, 
That's when you put the kingdom first. God takes care of all your problems. That's why the devil's trying to distract us from the mission, from the purpose. Be wise, love God and obey. And dominion comes right into your family and all those things you can't fix, he'll fix for you. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10, 11 tells us it's all about salvation. It's about those that are deceived thinking they are saved or they're helping people by doing all these works, running all over the creation. It's hard, I say this with with a burden. It's hard to find a pastor or a minister today that's not deceived. I don't don't say that with any kind of hallelujah. That's grieving to me. All authority has been given to us. We read in Matthew 28, 18... Ephesians 1, 20 and 22. We have all the authority. God's given us all the authority, but not to do what you want, to do what His kingdom calls for. So how do we overcome the worlds of distraction and deception? That's what I want to focus on. How do we overcome this? First, there's two main things. First, you have to have good soil. Remember the parable of the sower? The word went to all people, but only those who had good soil produced a fruit. So you got to have good soil. Matthew 13, 23 talks about the good soil. Hosea chapter 10, verse 12 and 13 tells us that fallowed ground must be plowed. It's, it describes the heart as unplowed fallow ground. Weedy and full of, not suitable for growth. So what are the things that make our heart suitable for growth? Number one, you must be humble. you got to be humble. you got to say, God, not my will, but yours be done. That's how you be humble. That's the message of Gethsemane, by the way. Number two, you must be teachable. We got people running, I've never seen it. They're running all over wanting to teach everybody and they've got no fruit in their life. It's like, why would I want to listen to anything you got to say? I mean, I'm just being honest. So you must be teachable. I'm thankful that we have, I believe, God's collected some teachable people in this church. You're going to love this third one. Because see, a true elder is somebody who doesn't tell you what they think, they tell you what God says. And most of the time they'll tell you, have you asked God before you ask me? So you must be submissive to the Spirit and to elders. That's a hard thing to tell. So, well, wait a minute now. You don't know what my daddy was like. You don't know what my mom was like. I got a hard time being submissive. Well, that don't mean you get to be unsubmissive. That just means that's something you got to work on. you got to get healed. The second part, first got to have good soil. Then you have to learn the message of Peter in the boat. This is Peter's boat right here. If you all will forgive me, I won't sit back down in the boat again. But you get the picture. Matthew chapter 14, 22, starts talking about Peter in the boat. Can I tell you a little, give you a little instruction here? First of all, when you're in the boat, don't worry about the storm. The storm has been sent to get you out of the boat. Is anybody listening? Don't worry. When you're in the boat, now look, you know, Peter's in the boat and all the disciples are in the boat and the the storm's coming and the Sea of Galilee, Billy's, no, we were out on a boat on the Sea of Galilee and that thing gets rough because it's very deep. And I'm sure they're in a storm. I mean, it was bad. And Jesus comes out on the water. Now, so there's some principles, as I illuminated earlier, 
that I think are so deep in this that we've got to get. And here's the first thing. Don't listen to the people in the boat. (laughs) Don't listen to those people that are around you. Don't listen to those people that you're living with. Don't listen to those people. Because they'll keep you in the boat. you got to listen to God. Thank God for Peter. Now, first of all, you got to remember, they're in a storm. They're holding on for dear life. And Jesus comes out on the water walking. Now, here's the question. Why didn't he just appear in the boat? He could have done that if he wanted to. But no, he's walking on water. And at first, they thought, they didn't know who it was. They, were, they thought, it's got to be a ghost. Peter says, Lord, if it's, it's got to be you. Peter wasn't trying to get out of the storm. Oh, somebody better listen. He's after Jesus. Amen. He's focused on Jesus. The storms are not the problem. The problem is we're not walking following Jesus. The storm's supposed to help you learn to focus on Jesus. And so thank God for Peter. I mean, who? they didn't go, no, wait a minute, let's think about this. This is like society day. So wait a minute now. No one's ever really walked on water before. I'm not sure this is scientifically possible. Thank God he didn't start with the reasoning. Peter's like, Jesus! And Jesus, you know when Jesus shows up, the first thing Jesus said to him, Jesus speaks to him and he says, don't be afraid. It's me. You think that's what he's saying to us today when you look at the world and what's going on? He's saying, hey, don't be afraid. I'm, st- I'm still right here. I ain't going nowhere. I'm out here on the water. I'm in, I'm in this with you. He's in this with us. So these are things we've got to remind ourselves of. <laughs> you ready for this one? This is the best one. You know where your purpose is? It's in God's will. You know where your protection is? It's in God's will. You, you felt that. You've experienced that. When you learn that, you ain't worried about the boat. You're just worrying about God's will. And Jesus said, Peter. Peter said, God, if it's you, tell me to come. Jesus says, come. Peter's out of that boat. I'm sure they're grabbing him, pulling him back in. He said, Peter, you're going to drown. I said, no, I'm not, because I'm in God's will. God said this to me. He was showing me this years ago, and he said, what did Peter walk on? I said, Lord, he walked on the water. No, he did not walk on the water. He walked on the Word. He walked on the Word. You see, Jesus said, notice he didn't just jump out of the boat and start walking. He said, Jesus, if it's you, tell me. To come. He sought God for a word. Jesus, what do I do? What did I tell you when you started praying? I said, seek God for a word. Don't just come here because Brother Steve said, seek God for a word. That's how you live by faith. You say, you don't say, Pastor, we're in a freaking storm. It's bad. I don't care. (laughs) Seek God till you get that word. Well, you don't understand what's going on around me, Lord. I got all kinds of problems. It's a man. See God for a word. Well, I ain't heard nothing. Then don't do nothing. He ain't speaking right now. Then just wait until he does. But what you don't do is jump out and go, hallelujah, and sink to the bottom. Because that's what was happening. Help us, Lord. To not be distracted. Now, let me just tell you, this is is some deep stuff here now. But I want you to write down, if you're taking notes, or if you have your Bible, go with me to Psalm 91. And you know, it's interesting that we had a testimony of this one from someone who's been to Israel with me on this trip that I know I've talked to y'all quite a bit about. And in that trip, we walked in dominion. 
And I, I never experienced anything like that uh, on that trip because the power of God was everywhere. God moved everywhere we went to the point where people started talking about it all over Israel. It was wild. I mean, the glory fell on Mount Carmel. I mean, the Sea of Galilee, the Arabs were afraid to move the boat because the friends of God showed up. I mean, Billy's falling out in Gethsemane. So I want to tell you that dominion is where the power is. Psalm 91. Look what it says. He who dwells in the secret place, not he who's been saved, not he who loves God, he who dwells, that means you're constantly abiding with God, following Him. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. That's protection. That's where your protection is. Your protection's not in the boat. Your protection's with Jesus. we got to get that. And this whole psalm is a psalm about all the protection. If you ever heard any word about being protection today, you better get this one. Because this whole psalm is about protection. It says thousands will, will fall at your side, but they, it won't come near you. Pestilences, we're going to have to learn to deal with that. They ain't going to come near you if you follow these directions. Look what it says, verse 14. Because he set his love upon me, Therefore, I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. God says that word set means an established foundation. So God says, because you've set your love upon me, I'm going to protect you. I'm going to watch over you. You can't stay in the boat. You can't stay in Egypt. You've got to enter the promised land. Amen. Now, I want, to, I want to take you to Numbers 14, verse 21. I'm going to, I'm going to show you something, something profound if you've never seen this before. Numbers 14 is the discussion or the passage talking about the Israelites entering the promised land. They come to Kadesh Barnea and they send out the spies. And they're trying to navigate this whole thing. Moses is having a discussion with God up in verses 18 and 19. Um, he says, pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray according to the greatness of your mercy. Just you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. Verse 20 is God's response. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word, Moses. Verse 21, now look at this, y'all. But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Amen. I was like, what? what? What is that about right in the middle of this discussion of Israel in the promised land? Can I tell you that this is where protection is? Yes. It's in God's glory. And that is your promised land. That's why it's in here. That is your promised land. That is what your destiny is. You have been called to enter and live in God's glory. That's what, that's what this is all about. It, the Old Testament is a shadow of the real. What is the real? We're called to enter into the glory and to live in the glory of God. That's why it's in this passage. You can't stay in the boat. You can't stay in Egypt. Israelite, you, you've got to enter the promised land. And the Bible says that manna fell and the cloud led them all through the wilderness until they got to the Kadesh Barnea where they entered in. And then the manna stopped. Is anybody listed? Yes. The manna stopped. Yes. You know why it stopped? 
Because God says you ain't going to get fed again until you learn to enter and take the land that's your destiny. And this war that's going on right now is, if you go read it, Israel owns all that property they're fighting over. Lebanon, Gaza, West Bank, Israel owns it all. And they're fighting it because they've given some of it away trying to make peace with everybody. You better start obeying God and stop trying to make peace with everybody. Wow. Wow. Praise the Lord. Yes, Lord. Whew, Jesus, Peter didn't want to get out of the storm. He wanted Jesus. That's a picture of dominion. That's why he walked on. That's how he entered into that power. And we need that in our lives today. Church, we don't do nothing unless we get permission. Don't go walking on water. You'll sink. It's like a rock. But if God tells you to go walk on water, you'll walk on water. Do you know the power of God telling you to come? Do you know the power of God giving you a rhyme of word? Said, so go here or do this. You can do anything. You have no limits. Unless you don't hear from God. Think about that. Unless you don't hear from God. That's why the devil's trying so hard to distract and deceive God's church. But once, listen, and this is what a lot of us are struggling with. Once you get out of the boat, and I say, you're in the boat, and you hear Jesus. Jesus says, come. He's like, hallelujah, I'm getting out of the boat. I said, don't get out of the boat, Peter. He says, shut up, I'm getting out of the boat. (laughs) So Peter steps out of the boat. The faith I needed to get out of the boat won't serve me now. i got to have greater faith. When you're walking on water, listen to me, you better have stronger faith than you had in the boat. Anybody will want to get out of the boat if Jesus says come. But look, when you're out of the boat, your perspective changes. Now you ain't sitting on a seat just rocking. You're, st- you're walking in the water and the wind and waves are all around you. You see, there ain't no wind and waves in the boat. Wind and waves are when you start walking. So then you must become... And see, this is where we struggle. We think, why has it gotten so bad? I'm going to get back in the boat. You know why it got bad? Because the devil don't want you walking on water. He don't want you living this. You can talk about it all day long. Just do not live it. When you start living it, man, here he comes. Wind and waves, all these problems. Pastor, I don't know what's going on. I don't know why I'm having so much trouble. I can tell you why you're having trouble. You got out of the boat and you're walking on water and here come the wind and waves. But you must be more radically focused on God than ever before. That's the secret of Peter in the boat. That's why the SS Glory is parked, is is docked here. (laughs) Hallelujah. God's trying to get us all into a greater faith. Faith to step out and to do what He's called you to do. You know, I, I'm not trying to, I, I always hesitate. God gives me these examples and I'm afraid if I say something, y'all all get mad at me because I didn't mention you. But I think all of our people are in the same place. But I want to recognize somebody. Shemia is not just speaking about God. Shemia is testifying to her family here comes, <laughs> and Car, I'm telling you, you're, you're, God's going to do something mighty in your life. I know you've been going through some things. So shows your other daughter, uh, Kyla. I'm telling you, that's what it's about, y'all. It ain't about sitting at home praying for everybody else. It's about getting out, walking this out. Stay focused on God. If you can't stay focused on Him, He'll call you out of the boat. Peter walked on the Word. Remind yourself. And what he, look, well, if I, what if I get out and I sink or the waves hit me? Jesus will be there. 
What, when you're out of the boat, Jesus will be there to pick you out. So you can't fail. If I sink, I'm learning something. You can't fail out of the boat. You can fail in the boat. But you can't fail out of the boat. And you hear people say, well, what about... So we first have to repent of idolatry of self, being all worried about you and your issues. That keeps your eyes off Jesus. The devil will use whatever he can get. He'll use whatever. He'll use your wounds. He'll use your past. He'll use your children. You wonder why they don't behave. Maybe when you brought God's will into them, they'd start behaving. Is anybody listening? I'm just saying, you, you have done a terrible job. And I'm speaking to myself too. Of trying to tell them what to do and it ain't worked, has it? It's like one lady called me up and she says, Pastor, I don't know what's going on, but my children already know how to disbehave. Nobody taught them that. They were, I said, they were born with it. What are you talking about? They were born with it. You better teach them like that lady. So you better start doing what God, but I've told them to do what God says, but you ain't doing what God says. But I've been preaching it hard, Pastor. They won't listen. Right, but they will listen when you start doing it. I think somebody's hearing me this morning. I repent for not being committed to the mission of Jesus. Remember, he said, follow me. He didn't say go to church. He didn't say pray. He said, follow me. Amen. Which means his first priority is to form you into his image. And once you get there, you can help others. Live the example. Live the example. Live the example. Don't preach it, but live it. Many people find trouble out trying to tell everybody what to do. Instead, they ain't living, they ain't following Jesus. Learn the role of devotion and prayer. If you love Jesus, like you say, your prayer life, devotion life should be like a rocket ship. Don't be double-minded. That's what James 1.6 talks about. Don't be double-minded. God said to me years ago, he said, he said to me, he said, you know, brother, he said, you know, son, he said, I'm the one that actually makes the disciple. I said, Lord, I know that. I said, what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to teach him how to create a spiritual environment. A life that maintains their focus, their peace and their fruitfulness. Does that sound all that bad? It requires devotion first, humility and submission. You know, wounded people don't like to submit. You know why? Because they got control problems. And I know we got people here with control issues. You know why people control? This is this $100 worth of counseling for free. You know why people control? They got a wound somewhere. They're trying to protect it. It could be in their spirit. It could be in their physical body could be in their emotional area they got a wound so if you got a control problem that's easy to see i'm in control too much i want to give it to god but i can't i have a hard time then you better get that wound healed learn the lesson of faith that's what the boat's about find the area of weakness in your life and most of those weak areas are the areas where you keep failing and start cooperating with God. Faith building is not easy, but it is the key. <clears throat> let, me, let me just tell you, uh, I'm trying to be careful. I'm trying to make sure I'm supposed to say what I'm getting ready to say. That's why I'm pausing. <clears throat> One of the ways... God tests you in your faith is with health or with finances. 
<clears throat> and we, we have a radical giver in this church who ties off her gross, not what she brings home. I won't mention her name because it would embarrass her, but I think y'all probably know who I'm talking about. I remember, you know, if we just understood how in the Old Testament they tithed, that means you gave God 10%. In the New Testament, you died, He owns 100%. You don't only give him what he says. It could be 10, it could be more. But then you spend the other 90 the way he tells you to. I'm giving God 10, but I'm not obeying him and the rest of it. Then guess what? You're in trouble. So the Old Testament is about tithing. New Testament is about giving all of it to God as you direct and spend it. I remember this story. This, this is about how you not walking in faith affects everybody around you. You just don't realize it. Eddie Brown uh, was pastoring a, a pretty good-sized church. I'd preached there several times. And he called me one day. He said, man, we've always been in the black. We always take in more than we need. And he said, but this last Sunday, for the first time since I've been pastoring here for 15 years, we went in the red. We didn't bring in enough. It's like, wow. And he said, so I started seeking God about why. And God said, somebody in their church who was a leader, he told him who it was. It was the worship leader. The worship, if you see this video, I'm sorry, I'm telling on you. He said, worship leader's not tithing. Eddie's like, whoa. So Eddie goes to the guy and he says, son, or whatever his name was, he said, are you not tithing? He said, no. And they were paying him, I don't know what it was, but like two, two or three thousand a month to do worship. He said, are you, are you tithing? He said, no. He said, God told me you weren't tithing. He said, you got to tithe. He said, if you don't tithe, then you gotta, you, I've got to remove you. And you know that guy left the church? Wow. Gave up the salary. I mean, I'm just like, dude, what in the role? Eddie, you know what Eddie told me? He said the next Sunday they got the biggest offering they've ever gotten. I, I could tell you a hundred stories just like that, y'all. This person that I mentioned who gives out of her gross is... She makes so much money. She gets all this extra stuff. She gets, she, the bonuses she gets is always bigger than she thinks it's supposed to be. Y'all know who I'm talking about. but I'm, And I'm not trying to exalt anybody. I'm just trying to tell you, y'all, it's all about faith. Whatever God needs, whatever He's working on, it, don't be embarrassed. Praise God you know what He's working on. And I'm not trying to pull money at anybody. That's between you and God. So, and, and look, you say, well, Pastor, what do you, I said, look, I'm just going to keep praying and let you deal with God. I'm not going to get mad. I'm not going to withdraw and I'm not going to control you. I will pray for you. But you're headed down a long and difficult road. I remember, you know, we had a guy come in here who stole our pickup truck. The night it happened, you know what I heard the Lord say? He's chosen the harsher path. That's, that's what it is. When we don't understand about life and faith, we're just choosing the harsher path. And I don't know about you, but I sure am tired of fighting this thing and battling all this stuff. Because when you start learning to live by faith, life becomes a stick of butter and you become a hot knife. And I want that for everybody. 
you know, people have problems, people have stuff around them. It's all about, if, you, if you'll see life like this, everything starts to work, will start to work for you. Everything will start to open up. And look, you may not get everything fixed, but you'll start hearing God speak into these areas. You don't need to go, go fix something because I told you to. You need to go seek God about this word and let him affirm or, or correct it or whatever he needs to do. But I feel like this is the heart of Christianity. This is why the church is deceived. This is why so many people are struggling. This, I've never seen ministers begging money and, and, and manipulating things to get money out of people. Well, I do, I do understand why. It's because they're not doing what God says. When you do what God says, He'll provide if the money's got to drop from the sky. You say, well, I got a lack. Well, then you you got to get in this. Because there ain't no lack in the faith walk. That's what I said, but seek first the kingdom and it's righteous. And God says, I'll give you. And if you read the context, he's talking about your home, your finances, your clothes, all the stuff you need to live. If we're struggling, this is why. If you've got health problems, this is why. God is, listen. Right now, we're in a time where if you can't hear God, you're in trouble. We've got to hear God in these hours. And it's going to get worse, I'm afraid. We're going to have a great revival, but the rest of the world's going to be in a mess. So you've got to be those lights God's called you to be. Let's pray. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for this message today. Thank you for your love. God, we repent for not walking by faith. I repent, Lord, where I've been off track. And I know there's things in my past where I've been off track. I repent, God, because I, I, my goal is to live by faith and to follow you. And I pray for each and every of my brothers and sisters that you begin to move in their life in these areas of weakness. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.